Good morning or evening, depending on when you're watching the service. This is our Ash Wednesday worship. We wish we could be together. We wish we could share in Holy Communion, but some things just are not possible right now, 11 months into the COVID pandemic. We hope that most of you have received by now, and I need to say a word of thanks to those who took so many of these packets out to deliver. If you got the little purple package in the mail, it had in it a vial of ashes that you, if you want to use these today for the service, I ask that you get those ready. But please never mix these with water. If they seem a little too dry for you, we tried to, to put enough oil in them so you could spread them, but they tend to dry out very quickly. Oil, olive oil, baby oil, canola oil, any oil that you have in the house will work, but no water. Also in your packet, you have received a cross, a little cross for your family, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. But we welcome you as this is the beginning of our Lenten observance, and we'll begin to worship with our voluntary. Please join us in the call to worship. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. We invite you now to join us in our hymn, Sunday's palms are Wednesday's ashes. traditional psalm for this day is the psalm that David wrote after his sin with Bathsheba and when the prophet Nathan confronted him. In his anguish, these are the words that he wrote to God. 
Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. Our gospel lesson this day comes from the story of Jesus' temptation, this time from Mark's gospel. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you've been to the grocery store lately or to Walmart or any other store or perhaps the pharmacy where some of you, I hope, are getting your vaccine for the COVID pandemic, You've seen lots of Valentine candy giving way to Easter candy. Because there is no such thing as Lenten candy. There are no Lenten decorations. What Lent is, is the time to remove the decorations. It's the time we don't even sing Alleluia in church with our hymns. It's a time of introspection. It's a time of self-denial. And Lent is really what we make of it. For some folks, Lent has a lot of memories attached, some good as well as some not so happy ones. Being told that you had to give up something that was pleasurable to you in order to focus your hearts and your minds on God. And if this sort of fast works for you, by all means undertake one. But one of the ways to make Lent meaningful is to move from religiosity into sacred practice. It's a move from doing things for the sake of doing them to a sense of discipline that calls us to look at what we're doing, to do it intentionally, to do it with integrity. Not to go around saying, oh, I haven't had chocolate in six weeks. But as scripture teaches us in the traditional passage for today, which we did not read, Jesus tells the people, don't be like the hypocrites when you pray. Don't mangle your face and look distorted and go, oh, woe is me. Instead, wash your face, anoint your face with oil so that you might look with gladness in the world. And what you do in secret, your Father will see in secret and will reward you. Don't pray like the hypocrites do on the corners with lofty words and phrases, but instead pray to your Father who is in secret, and in secret he will hear you, and you will find your reward there. So let's get rid of religious practice and get into authentic spiritual formation for ourselves. Perhaps instead of giving something up this year, you might take something up. Take up the daily reading of scripture, not in the religiosity way, 
religiosity is not the word there, the religious way, the holy, holy, holy way of saying, I will read scripture whether it kills me or not. I'm going to get through this book. I'm going to endure. But open the scriptures. Go to the story of Jesus and his salvation. You could read the entire chapter of all the 16 chapters of Mark in very short time. Or pick a gospel and read the stories of Jesus every day during Lent so that you might come to see yourself in his words. Just as he says, repent and believe the gospel. Repentance is what we're called to do. So if we're going to move away from religiosity, we also need to move away from penance. Penance is different from penitence. Penance is punishing ourselves in a way that we think would be pleasing to God. Practices that happened so long ago in the church where people would literally beat themselves or wear rough clothing so that they might suffer physically in a way to remember Jesus' suffering. That's not what God calls us to do. God calls us to acknowledge that Jesus suffered for our sakes, though we don't have to suffer anymore. But penance is not what we're called to, but we are called to be penitent. To be penitent is to take the season of Lent, to look into our own hearts, to find the things there that we need to rid ourselves of once and for all, not for 40 days and 40 nights, not counting Sundays, but to rid ourselves once and for all. And then that is an act of contrition. That is an act of sorrow. It is not what brings about our salvation. It is the fruit of our salvation. It is our response to God. So if you want to give up something, give up judgment. Give up anger. Give up the words that you say in anger quickly so that you might replace them with words that are comforting and hopeful and healing to others. Give up your negativity. Give up your self-doubt and your self-punishment because ultimately what we're called to be about is not to be about guilt, but we're to be about responsibility. Guilt is a wasted emotion. Guilt is a waste of our energy because what guilt does is to say that God has forgiven me in Jesus Christ, but I can't forgive myself. Therefore, I must wear this like a chain around my neck for the rest of time until I leave this world. That is not what we are called to do because Christ came to forgive our sin, take away our sin, the stain, blot out my iniquities, David said. Don't hold my transgressions against me. Let me move forward without guilt into the freedom that you have promised me. O oh Lord, my God, my Savior, and in David's understanding, my shepherd. So if we're called to give up guilt, there's a difference between guilt and responsibility. Not, I'm responsible for the problems of the world. I'm responsible for everything that's ever gone wrong. I'm responsible for my own mess. Sometimes we are responsible for our own mess. But that gets us into guilt. But to say, I am responsible, and in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm going to live in a new way. I'm going to let God's love and God's grace transform me into the person that Jesus would have me be. In a few moments, those of you who are willing are going to take that little vial of ashes. And if you feel called to do so, we invite you. If you live with others, one person should probably do this. If you're living in close contact and you're touching one another in your household, take a little bit of oil on your finger and then make the sign of the cross either on the forehead or on the hand of those around you, and even yourself, because it doesn't take a priest in the United Methodist sense, because I'm a sacramental minister, for communion and for baptism. But the imposition of ashes is nothing that requires a pastor or a priest in any sense of the word. Ordination is not part of this. Because just as these ashes were transformed from last year's palm branches. We didn't even get to distribute those to you last year because we were told it was not safe to do so. But as Kara, and thank Kara when you get a chance, Kara took the ashes to her home and burned them for us this year and ground them into powder. Just as those palm branches that waved by that crowd that shouted Hosanna, the same crowd who days later would shout crucify him, were transformed into ashes. So God can take the ashes of our sin and transform them into something life-giving and wonderful. I said that I sent a cross home to you, and this was my gift to you this Lent. It's small, and I suggested that you keep it where you can see it in your household. 
Maybe at your dinner table so that you remember to give thanks to God for the meals that you have. If you have children in your family, especially little ones, let them take turns holding it as you say your daily prayers. But if you're like me and you live by yourself, then put it where you'll see it every morning and evening, either next to the phone, if that's how you use your alarm on your telephone, or next to your glasses like me, because that's the first thing I have to reach for in the morning, so that the first and last thing you see is the symbol of our redemption. It's a plain wooden cross, but what I'm hoping that you'll do during this season of Lent is as a family or as a couple or as an individual, think of a way that you can beautify and glorify this cross. And some of you are probably saying to me, I'm not an artist. I am not an artist. Well, you don't have to be an artist. You could take some flowers, either fresh or artificial, and glue them inside. A lady that I know has made one of these for me. It's in my office now that's covered with seashells. And then it's covered with um, some kind of polymer that holds them in place and lets them shine. Anything that you do, just to remind yourself that, that Lent can be for us a season of transformation. We call it the journey. But it only gets you someplace if you're willing to go there. Because Lent is what we make it. Lent is about growing closer to God so that we may grow closer to one another in God's name so that we might learn to look into the world as Christ looks at the world with love and compassion, with grace and peace, so that we might see the world as those who don't know Christ and give them an invitation, not condemnation for their lack of faith, but an invitation to grace because we have seen grace made real for us in Christ Jesus. Mark's story of the temptation doesn't go into all those things that we know that Jesus was tempted with. Jumping off the tallest pillar of the temple so that God might save him, so that he might prove who he is. Being offered, after 40 days of not eating, the ability to turn the stone of the desert into bread. Jesus says, you don't live by bread alone, you live by the word of God. And then being shown the kingdoms of the world and saying, all this I will make yours if you worship me. Those are the things that Jesus turned down on our behalf. But in Mark's gospel, it's a very short passage that just as he was tempted, the wild beasts were there and the angels ministered to him. But then he began his ministry. John was arrested, his beloved cousin. But Jesus did not let that stop him. He went into the world to heal, to teach, to redeem. And he called people to a life of repentance. So may your Lenten journey be one not of penitence, Not of penance, but penitence. I know I was going to get that wrong. Not a journey of penance, but of penitence. Not a journey of guilt, but a journey of responsibility. And not a journey that is filled with rituals for ritual's sake, but one that leads you to a fuller, deeper understanding of what Christ has done for the world and what Christ is willing to do for you. So that we may come to Easter with joy unending and abiding through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we're going to hear from Elaine. Come 
to the garden where Jesus is praying, seeking his Father in evening's dim light. Come to the shadows and watch with the Savior. See I invite you to take your vial of ashes now as we say the prayer that is traditional for Ash Wednesday. Almighty God, from the dust of the earth you have created us. May these ashes be for us a sign of our mortality and penitence and a reminder that only by your gracious gift are we given eternal life through Christ our Savior. Amen. Those of you who are willing now, I invite you to dip your finger into the ash to make the sign of the cross, either on your forehead or your hand or the hands or foreheads of those in your family. The traditional words are, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return or repent and believe the gospel. I invite you now to take this moment of reflection and ritual. These ashes have been a symbol of both our mortality and our penitence, but also God's grace and willingness to forgive. So would you join me now in the response? In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We continue to worship now with our hymn. Lord, who throughout these 40 days... And through these days of 
Lent is a journey that will take you somewhere if you want to go there. But Lent is what we make it. When we're filming this today on the 13th of February, which is Saturday, and so if I feel a little, seemed a little tongue-tied, that's because I was doing two sermons back-to-back, -back, trying to separate them in my mind, and I don't always do so well with that at my age. I don't think I ever did all that well with that. But tomorrow, Sunday, or last Sunday, if you're watching this on Wednesday, it was Valentine's Day. I will never forget the Lent when Ash Wednesday fell on Valentine's Day, which it does from time to time. Or actually it was the Sunday, just like this year. And if we were together, I might have tried this again. On the first Sunday of Lent, what I did was give everyone a Valentine. People are creatures of habit in the church, and so everyone sits in the same place. So what I did was I mentally went through and I wrote down everyone's name on one side of the congregation, put them on little slips of paper, did the same with the other. And then during the service, what we did was we passed the opposite offering plate full of these little slips with names on them, little valentines, through the congregation, and people got to pick a name. What I asked was that they pray for that person every day during the season of Lent. Now, after Lent was over, when we got into Easter, we had confirmation at the church, and one of the young women who was confirmed was a teenager. She was in high school. She was so excited. Her mother couldn't be there that day because her mother had to work, but her mother, who was Roman Catholic and worshipped with us on special occasions as her parents were divorced, was not able to be there, but everyone else could, and the mother said, please go ahead. I will watch the video later. And she was confirmed this teenager. But the evening of her confirmation, someone sent an anonymous text to her mother saying, where were you? Couldn't you even be bothered to come because you should have been there to see your daughter. Her skirt was too short and she was all over her boyfriend in the parking lot. That was really a great testimony to the vow she had made. This little girl who was 17 years old said she couldn't come back to church anymore after that because she felt too sad. And indeed, most of the confirmation class told me how angry they were and how hurt that anyone that day would make such an issue. But I didn't know then who her prayer partner was, her valentine was, for the season of Lent. And it was a little one who was five years old. And on the day that was going to be this teenager's last Sunday in church when she found out what had happened, this little girl said, I need to see my valentine. And I've prayed for her all through Lent, and I want her to know how much I love her. And her name is Lauren. And Lauren came forward, 17 years old, who had been so brutalized by someone's unkind, anonymous comment, knelt down and embraced this little girl who hugged her and said, I love you so much. Thank you for being in my church. Healing can happen. And I hope that whoever wrote that nasty gram to her mother knows that sort of transforming love in her own life as she decided to do something so hateful on the day of another child's confirmation in the season of Easter. It also shows you the power of prayer. And if a child can remember throughout every day of Lent to pray for the one just because she has her name on a piece of paper, she couldn't even read it. Her mom had to read it to her. She prayed for her faithfully every day. If we were to pray for each other faithfully, if we were to pray for ourselves faithfully, if we were to give up guilt and penance and punishment of ourselves and others for their sins as well as our own, we would know transformation and we would know a Lent that would bring us to that exceeding joy of Easter in a new way. Don't lose your hope. It is so hard to hold on to hope in these difficult days with the pandemic. We have been apart for 11 months this week, 11 months since we've all been together for worship. But know that you are loved. Know that you are joined in heart with this congregation. Know that we will be together soon. And pray for those who are still working to create a cure or a vaccine that will keep this virus from decimating our population. Pray for those whose hearts are aching because of loneliness. Pray for those who need help with paying their bills and keeping a roof over their heads and food in their stomachs. Pray for each other. 
and remember that it was by the cross of Jesus Christ that we are all saved. That God took what was a symbol of humiliation and pain and turned it into the sign of our redemption, our salvation, and our life eternal. So go into the world rejoicing in the love of God for you. Go into the world into this season that doesn't call us to be solemn, but it does call us to be serious, to look into our own hearts, to offer up to God all that is false so that God may transform it into a thing of beauty so that on Easter your little cross might reflect that glory. So go into these holy days in the name of God, who is Father, who is Son, who is Holy Spirit. You will not walk alone, and you will come out on the other side, a new and transformed person in the light of God's love. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you.